Uh, security, escort this gentleman out, please. Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. technology out there to go after that. There's lining, uh, there's what we call grouting, where actually you can go into the pipe and um, you can uh, you can pump, it's called polyacrylamide grouting, so you can actually air up a joint in a pipe that's leaking, and you can shove this uh, hydrophilic grout, it loves water, and it expands in water, and it'll actually seal off those holes. And there's liners that we can put in manholes, and so right now we're evaluating those technologies and finding out what's cost effective so that we can go out and go after that extraneous water. We've seen an extraordinary amount of, ex uh, of extraneous water this year. And if you look at the fall that we had last year, the low frost, and then the wet spring that we've had, uh, it's, it's created uh, a higher base flow than what we would typically see this time of year. All right. Well, data tour here. Yeah, have you been out here before? No, I always wanted to. And when I heard you're going to do this, I was like, God, I want to see this. So your office is out here? No, I'm at City Hall. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> We've got, oh, here we have, because I want to be, I'm talking to team that treats the wastewater, the maintenance team that keeps it. Paul. Oh. Team that maintains the collection system. Back in the days of my youth, we had to do some work at the at the sludge lagoons in the little town I was living in. So, it's like, uh, <laughs> so you, you kind of curious to see how things have changed. 
I always say to the team, I said, we always got to take people through the grit team. Yeah. Where it all comes in. It's kind of special on us. It's really happy. Yeah. It's really cool. It's good thing to look out today. That's far away. Yeah, so. This is where, like, you know, like, the trucks that come place water, this is where they come. Are you having to take, uh, uh, sludge from the dairy plant uh, up in Brookings now, did I hear? Mm -hmm. they, they bring us um, their lagoon over truckload of waste uh, every day. I think it's around 2,500 to 3,000 gallons of, of sludge off their DAP units each day. A couple things here. Um, I was just asked if we take our, our final stabilized waste product and, and put it out in a farmer's field. Yes, we do. Um, we, we take and uh, give away about 2,600 metric tons of what we call biosolids. That's the stabilized solids to the farmer's field. And it's a really good soil amendment um, that we give to them. It increases their crop yields. But the advantage to the farmer is the nutrients are really good and stays embedded in their soil. Uh, for a lot longer than commercial fertilizers. Now something we're getting ready to get into in a couple years is treating our biosolids. I'll kind of get into that a little deeper in the plant, what we do to get there, but we're going to treat our biosolids a little bit further to where they're going to be purified even more to where we're going to have the ability to give this to residents of Sioux Falls if we want to, to put on their yards. We can't do that now because we didn't, we're not treating it that well, but we're getting ready to get there. Or the, branded. Or branded, absolutely. Yeah, it'll be a regional plant, and it'll be kind of a come and get it situation. We're probably going to put something over here to where anybody that really wants it, you bring your truck and you have at it, pretty much. Um, to give you an idea, we we did a pilot test on this, and I took you know a couple five gallon buckets at home, threw it on my grass, and the stuff stayed dark green for three years, and I mean it was just phenomenal. So. But the main reason why we're doing this is we're running out, we're, we're, our plant is growing so much, we're kind of running out of fields close by to apply this to. And so to give you an idea how the numbers work, well, we, we truck about 1,600 truckloads out a year. When we go to dry this down, we're going to go down to between 30 and 60 trucks a year. And that's the economic driver for this, is get rid of all those truck hauls. But once we get it purified down to that level, it opens up a market wide open to us to where now we can give it to people that may want to put it on their yards uh, or some places like that. So, Has anybody ever used malorganite uh, on their yard for fertilizer? It's the city of Milwaukee's uh, stabilized uh, okay. sanitary sewer biosolids. Yeah. Uh, after they get it all stabilized and cleaned up and meet all the regulations. And it's been uh, a well established product for uh, 25 years. Yeah, it would look like dry yep. powdery stuff. Yeah. So, okay, so where are we at? Well, we're at the bar screen. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in there. This is the raw sewage. This is where it all comes in, okay? So, yeah, this is it, okay? It's a party. This is what you want so to just remember when we walk in and you smell it, it's all us, right? So we did this, okay? Um, by weight, it's still 99% water, but when you look at it, you're not gonna want any part of it, okay? So what we got is we call this our preliminary treatment. We're gonna see the bar screens. Um, it's kind of loud in there. I'll try and talk over it, but you know, let me know. What do the screens take out? So the screens are basically to take out things we don't want getting deeper into the plant that we tear up our equipment. That's rocks, rags, uh, plastic things, uh, turtles. We had turtles. So um, things like that. Uh, anything we don't want getting in there. And these screens are six mils. Um, wide so they do a very good job of removing things. Um, basically what we have after screens is all organic material coming through and getting deeper in the plant for treatment. What happens to this stuff is it gets cleaned up, we'll see it when we get in there, it gets scraped out, goes into a dumpster which is right on the other side of this wall and that goes to the landfill. After this treatment process everything that comes in the plant is now committed to treatment. So you won't be able to see the water too well in here but I'm going to take you to a box where you can see the water after that. Okay.
Camel Argolite. Last year in the airport, we got a lot of rain. Yeah, they're, they've really been using it over there for several years. The uh, F- yeah, we're going to go down yeah. there, but I want okay. to talk about the dual force that's coming in. Okay. Yeah, speaks so very high, what we imagine. have yeah. is we have a big project where we have, uh, we're going to increase our, our pipe pumping capacity of our main pump station over uh, by Great Bear. So what we're going to have is two force mains coming in right where you guys are, and we're going to put a big splitter box. So the city of Brandon's pipe comes in underneath the grass and over there. We're going to bring it around tight in this box. It's going to be a big box. Um, and then we have all the uh, pipes from Brandon Road and all the other tangent lift stations coming in here, and we're going to have a straight run in here. The problem we have is we put a flow meter in here that does not, it's just the design of it, it's not accurate high flows, and we need an accurate flow meter so that when we go for future expansions, we've got reliable data, but also gives us a common point to bring all the wastewater in. This stuff here, that's the shoring you see over these metal plates, they're going to start digging that hole here in the next week or two, and then about late summer, the two pipelines are going to come in about where you see all the stakes at right there. So we got a lot of construction to get ready to hit this plant, really the summer. Yours is actually measured at your pump station by your lagoons. So you guys are getting ready to, are designing right now a new uh, pump station. They'll have a flow meter there too. So right now we treat about 475,000 gallons of, of City of Brandon. And the next year we'll take care of you guys have after that. Are they paying by volume? Um, yep. 2,000 gallons. Yeah. yeah, they take care of the money. And then the, the, the horse made is fed. Is that the thing where there's, there's only one of them and now you're going to have redundant? Right, so yes, in, yes, um, and that'll be coming off this way. The uh, other force main that came in off, comes on off Brandon Road pump station was originally built with the plant that comes in underneath. If you see those light poles and this round tank here, it comes in between those in the grass. It cuts in over on this grass and it comes in on, on the east side of this building here. That force main is a 36. The one that we're constructing is a 42. Uh, so essentially we're more than doubling our capacity and the force main that we have is is not obsolete it still works it's it's uh it's just that we need we're at a point now where we need to double our capacity because we're starting to see uh, a pinch point at the force main at the pump station so that's explained to me i think that you could essentially turn a switch and you could send it down one while you're doing maintenance on the other <coughs> so you have the you got the redundancy. or if or if we have high flows uh when we get the new pump station in place we could actually use both force mains oh. and push all which water out here yeah, yeah. Okay. And then the other advantage was if something happened that that pipe became damaged, we have a now uh, a redundant backup. Yes, yeah, so you can switch to, to that and you can yeah. do the repair and you're not backing up. Absolutely. Or worse yet, putting it out in the river. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll head down those stairs and we'll get on to the next treatment process. Harbor, are you still at the bank? Oof, a little roasty here. Nice against the dark wall. <laughs> it's summer. It's better than tomorrow. That's right. Those are primary settling tanks. So what we're going to do is we're going to go take a look at that. But what's actually going 
down is when this water is going into those tanks, it's slowing down. So what happens is the water becomes stable or settled enough for all the material that's heavier than water to settle out, settle it out of the water, and we pump it into our digester. If I get to the digester, it's a little bit deeper in the floor. But by the numbers, when the water leaves these tanks, we've moved about 50 to 50 per 56 percent of all the material that came in. Now, it doesn't look good when it leaves there because you still have your solids that are still floating in the water. But by the numbers, 56% of the uh, uh, raw material has been removed in this tank. So we're going to go in there. It's not kind of a lot to see, but uh, I'll kind of explain what we got going on here. Mark, how many are you running for flow today? Right now, we're running a daily flow of probably about 22 to 23 million gallons okay. uh, into the plant. So okay. consistent right now. Okay, well, if you follow me, we're going to A little less exciting. Well, no, I'm saying this is one of the worst two cities, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I'm already yeah. done with it by this point. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Keeping busy. Actually, I think Christine met on this tour, so I'm watching her too. Where we want to go and how close. Thank you. You bet. So what happens is a little bit of 
that biology always sloughs off and goes further downstream. Now, by the numbers, those treatment filters get the water treatment to about 7% of the treatment that we, we do. We still have to do that nitrification process, but we, and we also have 30% of the uh, waste treatment. And that's the part we're going to jump into, is treating the remainder of that waste and nitrification process. So, the, so this water, by the time it's discharged, is it going to be also 79%? Um, when it goes through the plant, it will. When it's, uh, as it's going through the plant, the treatment plant itself, it goes through various treatment processes. So the, the treatment process is segmented. So you got 56% here. By the time you get to um, the end of the treatment filters, it's been uh, treated 76% cleaner than when it originally came in. So, uh, but there's still more, more treatment to go if you're doing after that. Well, I'm just due to the nature of the amount of time to chase that before I think we go. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. I'm just curious if the water, if the water is clean by the time you dump it. Yeah, yeah, you, you'll see it. It won't look much different than what I got here. Yeah. So, okay. David, we'll end up talking about some of that switch gear replacement. Okay. Water and wastewater treatment. And I landed in this and it's both cold here I am. So yeah. Wow. So okay, so what you're what you're in here is this is our control unit for the plant. This is where we have our shift change every day. Um, this is where the operators meet. And what you're seeing here is we call this our SCADA system. This is our computer system that talks to many computers out in the city, many computers within the plant. And to give you a little bit of an idea, is this is a, a graphic representation of our EQ basin. This is over by John Morales. Okay, what we're doing right now is we're peeling off. Uh, some of the water going into that would normally come into the plant, we're peeling off about six and a half million gallons into this tank over by John Morales. We're storing it there so that night, tonight, when all you guys go to bed and the flows go down, we're going to bring that water back into the plant so we can maintain a steady flow line. And that's what this chart is here. This is our flow line here that tells us how many gallons we got coming in. What that tells me though is this flow meter says that out there I still have about 20 million gallons going past that. If we did have this, that number would probably go up to about 30, 25 to 30 million gallons. So that means if we didn't have an EQ basin, we'd probably hydraulically overload the plant, and that would probably tell us, well, right now you need to spend a lot of money building a bigger plant to get that water through, only to find out that at nighttime, we would go down to maybe seven million gallons going through the plant. By storing this water in that tank, we equalize the flow over a 24 hour cycle. Um, these are different stations. This is Brandon Road Pump Station. Um, City of Brandon does not Contributing flows like that, that's just the name we got for it right now. Um, we need to change that. Yeah, yeah. So we, we we're going to build a new one in a couple years. We're working on the name. We haven't got there yet. But it, everybody's like, why is Brandon running that pump station? Well, they're not. It's just the name we gave it, right? 
Um, but this is uh, this is our main big pump station. This pump station can move, uh, we think, about 45 to 48 million gallons right now. Once we get the dual headers, we're expecting that to jump up to 60 million gallons. So it's a powerful pump station, but it's very old, and we're going to replace it in a couple of years. Um, this part here, and I'm just kind of going real quick over what we got here, is going to be our next treatment process, and this is where it's talking to sensors and letting us know the environment of our microbiology. The operators have to interface with this stuff all the time. And they also have a lab in there. There's an operator that may have just walked in there right now. He went out and collected samples throughout the plant, and he's testing it for different chemistry uh, analysis and biological analysis. And we have a microscope here that will do a, a, a microscopic exam of our biology to see what that looks like, what kind of bugs we have. And if we looked at, were to look at that, you would see things that look like uh, bouquets of poppies with little ciliates on them. You would see things that look like little uh, worms kind of brushing around other bacteria, kind of eating the surfaces of them, um, fleas, and things like that. And then other little cell bacteria is what you would see in there. And we're looking for this. What's the population look like? What's the balance look like? Is it looking healthy? And we monitor it every day to make sure it looks healthy. And we can tell if we get something toxic in because our bacteria respond immediately to it. So that's when we start looking at um, well, do we have some detox again? We'll do other analysis to determine it. And that's what an operator does. Okay? Um, we use these parameters up here um, to kind of target uh, our biology. We have what we call target sludge retention time. And that's this tank out here. How long do we keep the biology in the plant? So we're looking at, although it's a little smeared right there, greater than 10 days. Um, and just different parameters. And that's what we talk about every day. The operators have to know how to operate the computer. They take uh, maintain logs. There's a big spreadsheet that they interface with that calculates, does a lot of calculations for them. But the operators also need to know how to do those calculations by hand. And they are tested on it. That's how they get their certification. Do they know these formulas? And there's an abundant amount of formulas to know to be a waste water plant operator. So they have to be able to run these calculations in case we lose the computer and figure out, well, how much mass do you have out there? How much, um, if you have a certain target mass, how many tons of mass? In this case, we want about 71,000. Uh, pounds of biology in this tank alone. Okay, so almost 35,000 pounds, 35,000 or 35 tons of biology out there. If we go over that, we have to figure out how much to waste to get that out of it, and that's what the math is that they use. So that's kind of giving you a nutshell of what an operator does. Um, we have uh, everything from class one operator to class four operators working at this plant. The state of South Dakota has a four classification system: one being the junior operators, and four being the more uh, seasoned, experienced operators. To be a lead operator here, you have to be a class three or class four operator. Um, there are only two class four uh, wastewater plants in the state. Uh, you have to work in a class four plant uh, to be, well, you have to have worked in a class four plant to be a class four certified operator. There are 10 operators out here, uh, two operators on every shift, staff 24 7, eight hour shifts during the week, 12 hour shifts on the weekends. How much does the weather impact your biology? Quite a bit, and we're very dependent on this. So we'll start with the winter time. In the winter time, it gets cold and it, it cools down the water. Um, we measure our temperature in Celsius. Um, our water temperature in the summertime is about 25 degrees Celsius. I think sloppy math puts that about 75, 78 degrees. Uh, in the winter time, especially when we get those Arctic vortexes sitting on us, we go down to 8 degrees Celsius. Sloppy math, probably 48 to 52 degrees in there. So you got a big spread on temperatures. Well, what that does is, is it slows the microbiology down. Um, so what that means is uh, the trickling filters, which we didn't get a chance to talk to you, that microbiology, that basically stops at about 10, 12 to 10 degrees Celsius. So that shifts all the work over to this side of the plant. So what we do is we have to run more uh, microbes over here and bring more tanks online to accommodate that. Um, so that's the cold weather. Now we're transitioning, and we just made this transition about two weeks ago into a warmer weather and a warmer water. 15 degrees, the bacteria start warming up. It's kind of like, okay, now we're subtropical here and we like this. So we start working a lot better and we work a lot faster. So now they're moving a lot faster. But the problem is with the warmer uh, weather, the air density changes. Cold air, uh, it, it, it contracts, okay? The, the air molecules come closer together, so it's easy to keep the air in the tanks. In the warmer weather, they expand out, so we don't get quite so much air in the tanks. That means we have to run our blowers, which are these big machines out here a lot harder to get those bacteria oxygenated. Um, storm weather events, as Trent said, we get a lot of inflow and infiltration. Okay, so we have pipes, hundreds and hundreds of miles of pipes underneath the city, um, and it's common with every city that they leak a little bit, so we get a lot of water coming in. And when, let me see if I can figure this down, says, uh, 
this is an overview of Sioux Falls and lift stations. Uh, City of Brandon, your pump station is right here. Um, we know when it comes on. Uh, we run it probably about 10 o'clock at night to about uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, Harrisburg, they're down here, same thing with them. But nonetheless, these are very slow stations throughout the city of Sioux Falls. If we have a rain event over here, we start seeing alarm conditions coming on at these pump stations. In essence, we start seeing a tidal wave moving through the, uh, through the city, and we know our plant is getting ready to get hit. So it gives the operator, depending on what the storm event is, a few hours to start getting this plant reconfigured for high flow. And there's a big reconfiguration process we go through, and we have to monitor it really closely so that after the tidal wave moves to the plant, which can be hours or days, um, we can throttle the plant back down. But when they see it coming through, in this what we call a zoo lift station, we'll pop the graphic up and we can see how many pumps are running. Now, this system has the ability to control those lift stations from here, okay? So the technology is there, we don't. Because my team knows how to operate a plant, but we do not know what's going on with those lift stations. The operators haven't been there, they probably don't even know what the thing looks like. So we would not get in there and operate that lift station. But the reason we have the ability is if the collection team is out there and they're saying, okay, you know, I'm having problems controlling this pump, I want to be over here doing something, can you turn that pump on for me? They'll get in here and they'll turn it on. So they're talking on cell phone to the other team members. So we do get quite an impact from the weather all the way around. Uh, glad you asked that question. Mm -hmm. would, it make oh, uh, would it make sense to, you were talking the, the storage area by morale, as the demand for the plant, does it make more sense to store more as a way to add capacity? So here's the funny thing that we found out is as Sioux Falls has grown and the water um, flows have increased, what we were kind of doing and not realizing is we were putting more water into EQ to keep this level here um, throttled down about 15 million gallons a day. The reason we did is so we could keep from bringing other things online. But what happened, what we found out is these are huge, huge equalization bases. We were settling a lot of solids out in those in that tank. Well, what I was looking at for the last year is, well, how is it this town is growing and the flow is going up, yet the amount of organic material that we're getting in this plant is going down, down, down. And that was getting to the point to be a problem for my digest, and I'll kind of talk about those in a little bit, that I was becoming concerned about that, but I couldn't figure out how that was happening. And I went in and we were doing diagnostics on the lab, uh, the lab testing, everything. But we had other parts of the process that were confirming that was happening. So what happened is, this is a big tank out here, and the maintenance guy, uh, supervisor wanted to do some work on there. And so he said, hey Mark, can you shut this down and maybe not use this for a week? Yeah, okay, so we're just going to take all the flow past that if it wasn't going to work, it's going to come to the plant. Well, the next day I come in, and, and when we were at the primaries, I said the solid settled down, it goes 1%, we put it in the thickener, it goes to 6%. Well, we were running that uh, that pump for that thing there about six minutes, and all of a sudden, and the blanket was about six feet, and which is really low for us. All of a sudden, I come the next day, we got ten feet, timer's up to ten minutes. Aha uh -huh moment! I bet I know where my solids were at. So we found out that we we were settling it out. Now, normally you don't want to do that because that's not stable solids. Okay. Also, we were starving part of our plant, so I needed that to come in. Where I'm going to take advantage of that discovery is on these digesters. We got work coming up for the next three years. Then I'm going to have one digester out for about a year and a half. Well, that means I have less capacity. I'm going to take advantage of that and I'll probably keep about four feet of water in that EQ basin so I don't overload my digesters. So we do have a capital project uh, right. in the next five years to actually add a, another significant uh, lagoon right next to that one to give us more um, holding and storage capacity. There's two reasons to have EQ. One of them is what Mark talked about in the beginning, and that's to flatline your flow because it helps you manage energy and it helps you manage those peaks and it helps you control your costs because when you peak, uh, you get those costs. And then the other one is just storage for those peak events that we get. And so Mark um, has been using the EQ basin the way he's using it now to flatline. And then the bigger storage capacity is that tidal wave. And so, so you're not wrong, but you, still, you, you can only store so much and then you have to bring it back in. And so that's the stuff that we're working on uh, uh, in previous master plans that we're in the process of constructing and we'll work on going forward in our next master plan. So so it's a great question and we are going to put more in. So, yeah. I think that capacity of that new lagoon we're going to build is about 20 million gallons. Somewhere between 18 and 20 depending on yeah. what we can fit in. It'll be it'll be a less sophisticated uh, EQ than what we have there. What we have there is concrete. This is going to be a lined earthen cell. So it is just get water in there in a hurry when, uh, when storm water comes and then uh, we'll get it out in a hurry so it doesn't spend yeah. a lot of time in there. The, the storm water's cleaner, for lack of a better way of when you have those uh, peak events, I mean, it's hard to tell, isn't it? Uh, you don't know what's there until, right. but Ten you could assume that it's... 
technically you're right. It is cleaner, but it is in the wastewater system, and as far as the state and uh, EPA is concerned, it's wastewater. It needs to be treated the same way. Yeah. So. Yeah. He's right on the track I was going, which was, so if I go driving around by Morels, can I see this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, the street department is a better way to look at it. Uh, for my chambers? Or? Yeah. So, so what am I looking? What am I looking for? So, at the, where, where Chambers and Ash come together at the corner at the street department, and if you go to the uh, southwest of that, there's uh, two big concrete cells sitting there, okay. and that and they're just open concrete cells. That's our flow equalization basin. Oh. So, where they have the salt domes are just to the south of the salt domes. And, and that uh, monument up on the hill is a good spot to see this. Um, above the off cliff, yeah. yeah. So if you go down there, and you see, you'll, you'll look and you'll see morels. You see this big square rectangular mm -hmm. tanks are huge. That's what. We're that's the only place that we ever did. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to slow it down and to stop it, do you then have to do something with the force to get it moving again? It's, yeah. super cool. it's fed by gravity. It's gravity. Yeah. <coughs> so you can open it back up and start flowing yeah. again. Yeah. And it's just modulating the valves. <coughs> and they do that from here at the plant. So oh, they don't have to stop it. And have to yeah, so what would happen is we put it in through here. And we He's actually got it set to be 25% open, so he just he, he punches on that, brings up kind of an electronic keypad, he punches any number he wants, hits it, and it modulates that valve from here. And then we have this drain valve that he can do the same thing. If he wants to just kind of slow it down a little bit, which is what he's doing right now, he's just slowing it down a little bit, um, and it'll drain back in here. And so if we didn't want to bring any back, if we had a high rain event, we want to stack up here. We would open this up 100% and then close that 100%. And it forces all the water to go in those two tanks. Uh, high flow events, it only gives us about, oh gosh, 12 to 15 hours of, of detention time when we do that. Now, it doesn't mean all the water is stopping there. When we do that, we, the, this pipe is only so big, and I believe we can get up to apply about, say, 8 to 10 million gallons a day through that pipe. When we have high flow events, that still means I got about 25 to 30 million gallons getting past that coming into the plant. And that's not all the flow that the city's giving me at the same time. There's a lot of tangent flows that come around that that we still be getting. Yeah. Is, is there a lot of odor from that, or does Morels help cover that up? Uh, they there's help area. Yeah, there's yeah. not much order there. There's not much order. If you, can, if you go up to see the big spillway, um, where the big Sioux River is coming down, these tanks are right next to it. Yeah. And we don't keep uh, much water in there for that very reason. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's also where a lot of our sweeping um, sweepers all get washed out, and they have some of that grit settles out there. And multi purpose. Good deal. Okay. We'll go out and we'll take a right outside tank. So we have a lot of order issues again this year. Oh. The switch is going in. This yeah, is going out. It's all fast. It's like a dry. After you. Uh, no, Good work. Thank you. Yeah, actually, when we get done uh, with this part of the year, we'll get into that. That's a that's a powerful plant. So what I got here is I just want to pause here for a little bit. You see this hole over here? In that hole is a lot of like. old box behind us. This is the original switch gear box that was put in a circuit breaker if you want to, but very good. Um, they're getting old. They're over 30 years old. Our, our uh, maintenance and light team, they're working together to help replace all these. Now it's a tricky job because there's a lot of high voltage going through these things, so it's a really, uh, I mean, what do you want to deal with it? It's just like electric one, right? But they're taking and shutting down electricity. They're digging the old ones out and they're replacing it. This is the first one that they've replaced, but you can see a bunch of them throughout the plant, um, you see our new ones sitting up on that hill there, but as you go through, you can see these boxes that look kind of you paint peeling and all that, they're all coming out and getting replaced. We're hoping to have that done before the winter, winter sets in. Oh, uh, yes, our electrical provider, yep. And they come in right there, and that big brown box up there, that's our electrical generator. Um, we can supply power to the plant, run the whole plant. The only thing is, I got two blowers on, they're very huge blowers. We typically uh, will run that. We have electrical generators that I'm going to get into a little bit that augment that. So if we have a power outage, we can still 
solar in the plant, no backup power. So when we get higher capacity, like heavier equipment, more horsepower coming on, then we have, we fire up our, our generators that we run off the biogas. I'll get to that um, deep in the plant. And we make electricity off of our biogas and we help supplement uh, the work that that generator has to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to our aeration bases. And this base is this is a pretty biological process here. Coming back. Okay. <laughs> I think I know what you guys are talking about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you look in the tanks, you see brown water, right? You think it's poo, right? Well, no. Chocolate. Yeah. Well, yeah. Hershey's would love us for this. This is all microbiology. Okay. So what happens is we run the water through the primary tanks. We settle those solids out. The water's gone through those trickling filters. Okay. So we treated it to where 70% of the VOD is removed. Now what we got going on here is we got bugs in here. This is all bugs, basically. And this is the ones that I told you would look like poppies. They look like, like fleas, if you look at them on the microscope. Uh, they are taking and eating up the remainder of the bugs that aren't stable. They are also um, taking the ammonia and converting it into that nitrate. That's that fertilizer we're talking about. So this is the last stage of our biological process from here. Now what happens is, this is the critical part of any modern plant. You have to really pay attention to the health of these bugs. So what we do is we supply air. You see air coming in underneath here. And what we have is a box here and a probe here. That probe is me measuring the amount of dissolved oxygen in there. We keep a fixed amount of dissolved oxygen in there to keep these bugs happy. So what happens is these bugs are going to eat up. So as it comes in, we got four tanks, four rows of tanks. One, two, three, four. And we got three cells in each tank. As it goes through the cell, the first cell, the bugs are going after what we consider the raw organic waste, anything that's left and any of the bugs that are in there that aren't stabilized. They're gonna eat they cannibalize each other, okay? Life of this waste on a bug is not good. Basically what you have is you some guy looking for this other guy, he takes and jabs him right in the head, sucks everything out, and that's his meal, okay? The rest of them by the time they get here are going after that ammonia, okay? So it starts a little bit there. The ammonia is a, a three-stage process. It converts from ammonia to nitrite which is an unstable compound, so we take it all the way over to nitrate, which is now a stable compound. We can discharge that in there. The problem, EPA says that's a fertilizer, it's creating these dead zones. This is the meat of the process that we're gonna change. What we're gonna do is use these same bugs to turn around and take those fertilizers out. We're gonna make more tanks out there to create an anaerobic zone and an anoxic zone. So in the anaerobic zone, there's no oxygen in there. Same bugs, but there's no oxygen in there. And we're going to give them a lot of raw material, carbon. They're going to go after that, and they're going to get stressed. What's going to happen is they're going to be stressed, and they're going to release the phosphorus out of their cell mass. That's okay. We want that to happen. But what's going to happen is we're going to bring some of these bugs back into an anoxazone, low DO, and they're going to say, I don't have much oxygen. So they're going to go out to the nitrate, grab that O3 off that nitrate. That's their oxygen source. The nitrate goes off. We've now removed the fertilizer, and we bring them back in here and do the same process all over. Now. We got the bugs, we tricked the bugs into getting that phosphorus and stressing them out and they released it. Now they're in a happy environment and they're freaked out. They're basically coming up saying, okay, this is gonna happen again. I'm gonna take more phosphorus than I need so if they hit me with that stuff again, I'm gonna have plenty of fat, a lot of phosphorus in me to hold on to. Well, that's how we tricked them and we're gonna turn around and take them off to our digesters and waste them out of the stream and that's how we get that fertilizer out of the water. We don't have the tankage for that yet. And the reason we don't do that is all economics. Well, economics and how big. And that's what our master plan is going to tell us, is how big do we need to make this plant to do that treatment? Um, 
And then what's the best technology to do that? Where's the economics at and the best technology match up for us? And we don't know that yet. We know all the different kinds of technologies to get there, but which one's the best for Sioux Falls where it needs to be in the next 20, 30, 40 years? When you do a capital investment on a plant, you want, for the tankage, you want 50 years. That's a 50 year investment easy. If you can go beyond that, all the better. With these pipes and things, about 30, 40 years. So you want to make the right decision when you start spending all that money on a plant. So, kind of hit with you a lot of stuff. It's just a complicated part of the plant, but I figure I'd kind of give you a little, little segue into what we're getting into in the future. And this is where we're going to be talking about it as you hear a lot of our capital projects coming up in future uh, EPA regulations. Any questions on this? Carbon? Yes. Where's that going to come from? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have some of the carbon because of the raw material we got coming in. Now, what we can do is maybe shut those trickling filters down and bring some of the carbon in over here. What we can also do is bring a supplemental form of carbon in, usually methanol. And there's this other chemical I heard the other day that has a good carbon environment. Now, the problem with methanol is it's very flammable, very <coughs> dangerous. So I'm really not opting for that as my first choice. But we got to vet that in, vet that out. We're going to look at that a little bit more. But this other carbon, that uh, I forget the name of it, seems to be much safer to use. And it's, it pencils out about the same. So we're going to look at that a little bit as we get in there. So it's a supplemental carbon. And the reason we want the carbon, carbon's like sugar, OK? You give uh, a snicker bar to a kid, and he gets that sugar hit, he's got energy, he's going to do a lot of activity there. Same thing with these bugs. You want to give them carbon, so when you put them in that anaerobic zone, they're active. They're wanting that stuff, they're going active. If they didn't have the carbon, they'd just be lazy, and they would never excrete that phosphorus, and they'd never go after that nitrogen and denitrify that. So we, we want to trick them into wanting to do a lot of work, give them a lot of food, so they want to eat it. So that's the reason we put the carbon in there. So, okay. This is a digester. All right, well, let's go ahead and go on over here. I'm going to talk about some digesters real quick. I'm glad I paid attention in chemistry. <laughs> Me too. Did you get your apartment uh, all cleaned out or house for you? Yeah, but it was so funny. because this is a little segue, all right? So I told you the other day we keep those bugs in there for about 10 days. We waste them into those brick tanks over there which are called digesters. We don't necessarily need to go in there because you can't really see what they're doing. That's an anaerobic process. The digesters are the same thing as your stomach. Basically, they want the same, they want the same temperature as our bodies, about 98 degrees, okay? Um, they're taking carbohydrates, proteins, amino acids, and breaking them down. They're taking the bugs that have that and they're eating them up. So we keep this, we put a pound of solids in there, this bacteria here, put a pound of that in there every day, let's say. It stays in there for about 25 days. That's the stabilization process. So what's going on in there is you've got one bacteria that's an acid form, but they're going after that stuff that the bug's coming in there, and they're breaking it down, but they're making acid. So we have another bacteria that thrives on that acid and turns around and makes methane gas out of that. The advantage of the methane gas is we turn around and pump it over to that big brown ball over there, and we can use that as an energy source, okay? It has a high energy value to it. We have three generators that we run on that biogas and we produce our electricity. We produce our electricity to run this plant. As a matter of fact, we had the plant, this is the first time we did this, we had the plant configured to run the other day. For the whole day, we produced 90% of our electricity that we needed to run this plant. My boss was ecstatic. He's like, can you do that all the time? I said, well, it all depends on how much I get coming into the plant. 
But it was phenomenal. You turned on the second generator and I saw that for a moment it went up to 99% of all electricity we need and we're producing. That's not a good thing because what happens, we start back feeding into Excel, they get mad, they trip it, they cut our power off and they shut down the whole plant. So we, we throttle our generators down. But we were actually, that was the first time we ever got to that high level of energy production. We're going to try and mirror that um, in the future because we're going to build a new station here that's going to bring fats, oils, and greases in. Now, where's that going to come from? McDonald's, Burger King, all those kind of restaurants. When they have their french fries and stuff like that, they pour greasy stuff down the drain. There's a big intercept, a big tank outside there that captures that grease. Well, we're going to let them pump that and bring it to us. That grease is going to go into that digest. That's a simple carbon source, okay? Easy energy for the bucks. It's like giving a kid sugar all over again, okay? They're going after it. They're going to make a lot of gas for us. So basically, what we're going to do is going to be able to feed those bugs that fat, oils, and grease that's coming off these restaurants. We're going to feed it to them and make a lot more electricity. We could probably soften our electric bill to probably just bring in 10% of the electricity we need to run the plant. What does that mean on a monthly basis? Well, right now, that's about $70,000 a month it takes to run this plant for electricity. And we still co-produce about 50 to 60 percent of electricity we need. We still have the $70,000 a month utility bill. We bring that fat, oils, and grease in, we may get that down to maybe $10,000 a month. If that means the rate pairs, that means we're not looking at a rate increase quite so fast when we can do that. So how are they going to get that stuff here? Well, we're going to use septic haulers, uh, that, the, the haulers that pump out the septic tanks. We'll have a contract with one of those firms. We haven't worked out the details on how we're going to do that yet. And we're going to build a pump station over there that they're going to dump it into and we'll pump it into our digesters. So right now we're looking, I think 2018, 2019 to build that fog receiving station. Fog is the acronym for Path and Grease. That fog receiving station, 2018, 2019, and then we'll be ready to start receiving that grease. Where's that stuff going now? Down the drain. Yeah, so yeah. And the, the, it's kind of, when it goes down the drain, it's kind of like arteriosclerosis on yeah. our collection system. It starts building up around there, plugging it up, and so eventually it'll plug up, and then you get what we call a sanitary sewer overflow. It starts bubbling out of the manhole, yeah. and it goes out in the streets or, or that's, whatever. That's great. How yeah. long? So that's the second payback. So we have a collection system maintenance program, so every three years we're out in the system uh, getting our sewers. Strategy to get some of that patch on the grease out of our collection system so that we can uh, delay that jetting process even longer qualitatively. Uh, not only does it generate electricity and lower costs here, but also lowers it on the heat center in the city as far as our collection system. So a patient flight. How long will it take when you build that to recoup the cost with all the energy that you're saving in the end? Like, is there a guesstimate that? You know, after five years, then that's when we're really saving the bucks. It's obviously going to cost quite a bit to build that other station. Yeah, not so much as what you think, but um, I think we looked at a payback in what about five to six years on that. Yeah. So typically, if it goes past, bad. yeah, if we go past that, then the economics don't pan out for us. So it'll be within there. Yeah. Um, once we get the bid, we'll, we'll know. Yeah. Um, the big unknown for us right now is we know we got the energy source but it's how many people want to participate. We actually believe we're going to get more people than what we can actually take. Um, they're, they're looking for places to go with this, so we really think it's going to just open up a whole tidal wave of people want to come in and dump their, their grease on us. And what, not, because the digester capacity, we'll have to modulate are that. Are they not required to recycle that or anything? I mean, there's not, there's uh, not the a... The larger restaurants already do have large grease uh, dumpsters out back, and so, uh, you know, and if we have an issue with the collection team will say, there's a lot of grease in this area, and our environmental team will actually follow it upstream and go meet with them and say, you can't be putting this down. So, right, so we'll uh, take it for you for free. Right. That's right. So there's two types, there's yellow grease and there's white grease, and the white grease is the kind of stuff that, uh, when they wash dishes off, that's the kind of stuff that coagulates uh, as we can chew, and that's the stuff that ends up in the shoe. The yellow grease, the fire grease, that usually gets stuck in the dumpster behind the show, Okay, so we're going to segue. I kind of wanted to touch on that digesters so you can see what we do with them. That is a very critical part of the plan. Um, the same things that can upset our stomach, upset them. You change their diet, they will get upset, they will shut down. You give them something toxic like fuels or something like that, that will shut them down. One of the most toxic things to a wastewater plant is actually methamphetamines. And what has happened with a few plants is when they do drug busts and the drug dealers 
um, flush the drugs down the drain, it comes to the wastewater plants and it decimates them. It's toxic to the wastewater plants. And it starts in that digester. So it is basically what EPA has recognized that and what they will do is turn around and if they can uh, tie a plant upset into something similar to that, not only will the people that got caught for the drugs face the drug charges, but they will also face criminal charges for eco-terrorism. So they get caught that, they'll never see daylight again. So, but they do, these are uh, sensitive piece, uh, biological treatment processes that we do monitor very closely. If they become set, it reverberates into every direction of the plant and how I would have to operate the plant. So we do take care of those. So kind of jumping off the digest a little bit, back to these activated sludge uh, basins here. So we got the microbes in there, they've done their work, they turn around and turn the ammonia into nitrate, they finish polishing up all the raw material and they are ready to rest. So we take them over here, if we can walk over to the here, them over here and these are four tanks and it's just like those primary tanks we're going to put them in there and you see a center ring with the brown water in there that's where the water is flowing into this tank and it slows it down a little bit and what happens is the water overflows the blue trot it's a blue trot you see how clean that water is overflowing the blue trot the microbiology settles down in these tanks and we turn around and we circulate them back into that tank they get a chance to rest a little bit hungry so they're working up an appetite they're reproducing a little bit so we're bringing them back in here the water is going off to our filters by the numbers by the time we finish this tank we've removed 88 percent of everything that came into the plant we've taken the ammonia completely converted over to nitrate so we are safe to discharge this water but we still have two more treatment processes to go through after this good time to take that. Okay. So yeah, um, I understand somebody had a question on the cheese waste. Um, we take uh, about 2,000 gallons of cheese waste from Bell Brands Cheese up in Brookings and we take that into our plant and it actually goes in, if you see that brown truck there's a kind of a big garage door there. We take that truck in there in the morning, it comes in the morning about 9 o'clock and we pump it out of the truck into our digester. And what does that cheese waste do? Well that's, that's what used to energy the gas production for us. So that's why we bring that in here. Um, now we're looking at potentially bringing some dairy industries into town, so we have to reckon with how we want to deal with the waste that they have, because it'll be the same process um, if we bring a cheese industry in or a dairy industry in. We'll have to come up with how much can they discharge the plant through their sewer system, but then they may generate a waste. And we, we may look at, well, if they generate waste, do we want to take it down here and directly feed it into our digesters? We'll have to look at capacity and billing. We don't, we don't have that quite set up yet. But the advantages if we bring that in is we can turn around and make a lot of electricity off of it. Uh, or biogas. The advantage is if we make a lot of biogas, we can't, we can't use it for energy. We can clean it up, feed it. we got a big gas line out here. We can feed it into the grid and go on an open market where we can sell it. And I don't quite exactly understand how this works, but basically you can feed it into the system and you go on the market. Some outfit in California can buy the gas and we make the money off of it. So what we'll look at is, and, and the whole idea here is this plant to become as green as possible, reduce our carbon footprint, and uh, get as energy neutral as we can. So the economics, we can actually go into a little bit of for profit on some of our treatment processes if we take this out far enough. Do you charge them to, to bring Yes, we do. In? Yes, we do. And we will with the other industries as well, as, as it stands now, unless something changes. That it's all built based on strength, and it's pretty high strength. And we, we charge them by the pound of waste that they bring in, They're also making upgrades, so that's why it's appropriate to go year to year.
from it, but we don't expect it will. What will change is from it? Right now we target people bacteria for our limit, and we need to get below 200. I run about 15 to 20. Okay, so I'm way below the limit. Um, we're gonna switch over to E. coli. We're gonna get a discharge from it. That number will be uh, 120 E. coli per sample about that big. So you get a sample of 100 mils of water in there. Probably about like that much. I can only have 126 E. coli in there. I'm parallel testing that right now. So we're way low. Now, if I had to get lower, all I gotta do is keep that pump up. It's hardly working. I can keep that pump up and get down to, I can make them all go away. The reason I don't is economics. I'm way below my target right now, so I don't wanna burn up uh, the chemical that I don't need to. We spent about $120,000 on that six month cycle for disinfection. If I were to go down to zero, I would buy out another twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year on that for that, for that disinfection cycle. So it's just economics. But the potential is there. So it's a very robust system. I tell all the engineers, you go to disinfection, you really need to go after this. I don't think about disinfection anymore. Um, where we had the gas system and our work at UV, it was constantly on my mind. It was a pain in the butt to operate this stuff here on here. Okay, we're gonna go out and I'll show you what the water looks like leaving the plant, and then that's gonna wrap it up. As soon as you come in the city limits. Well, the septic, I ran into that septic tank guy. So there's about 26 residents. Okay, in Hall. Yeah, um, but they're not all in the city limits. We take the water, we run it through our filters, and this is what we call our chlorine contact chamber. By design, we need to keep the water in there for 30 minutes to get good disinfection. Um, we have it covered up, and the reason being is sunlight is kind of an enemy to chlorine. It breaks it down, the UV gets in there and breaks it down, so it interferes with our disinfection process, but also we were getting thick algae growth on the walls of the contact chamber. So we covered it up and we solved both problems, and that's got, that helped tremendously with reducing our chlorine demands we have in the system. But what happens is the water comes out of the filters, and there would be two mazes, basically. There's two separate channels there, and it would be like a maze. So it would come around and zigzag through there, and then get disinfected. And it comes out at this end here, and you'll take a look at it in a minute. And then right after it comes out, the disinfection has process is completed, and we take and introduce that sodium bisulfite right here in this channel here, as you see the water going through there, that neutralizes all the chlorine. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go look at the cascade, and I'll show you what the water looks like coming out of the plant at that point in time. But that's basically what this is. This is very safe water at this point in time, fully treated. That's why I say by the numbers, we got down to 99% of everything removed. Is before the apocalypse, no. 
After the apocalypse, if I was to take the Sioux River or this, I'd take this, okay? So why wouldn't I drink it now? Well, what we still have in here, okay, we got the fertilizers, we talked about that. Something my bugs don't like to do is they don't like to take medicine out. We all take medicines, okay? All of them. Pharmaceuticals, antidepressants, you name it. That's passing through here. That's in here, okay? Now, we know at some point in the future, EPA is going to go after that. The reason they don't do it now is it's a very complicated study and process to go after. If you want to go after a pharmaceutical, basically what you're going to do is you want to study that river, find out what's in that river, and what is it sensitive to. All right? You want to go after hormones? Which hormone and what level do you want to get down to? Do you want a part per million or a part per billion? Give you an idea what that number looks like. A part per million of a hormone, if you want to call it that, is like taking an Olympic size swimming pool, dropping one drop of water in there, and you got to detect that. A part per billion is how many more Olympic size swimming pools you still got to find that one drop. Now, what we don't know is what's out there and what is it sensitive to. Every river is a little different. What pharmaceuticals do you want to go after? You can pick something arbitrarily and spend millions of dollars to remove that stuff, and we may yet miss the target. So until EPA comes up with that, tells us, well, you're going to target this and this and this, we're not going to build the system to operate it. It's a very expensive system to operate, and we may get the target wrong. So it's not so much that we see that coming up in the near future for us. Probably if you want to look at a generational thing, it may be my kids, my grandkids that will start targeting that, okay? So why would I not drink it now? Well, there you go, right? So, so what happens is we're going down here and we're just letting it bounce down these steps to aerate it, okay? And then what happens is the pipe, if you want to cat a corner off it, goes underneath that tree, you see the Sioux River? That's where we discharge it. One pipe goes out there. One pipe goes out there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you what. Yeah. Great fishing spot. Give you an idea how much the fish like this. Um, we had that drought. What was it? 2012, 2013, something there. And the Sioux River was very stressed. There was Carlini water in it. Very hot. There wasn't very much oxygen in the water. And I went out there to look at that. And I walked out there. And I had fish. And I'm not lying. I had hundreds and hundreds of fish this big lined up at our outfall downstream for as far as my eye could see sucking up all this water because of the oxygen we were putting in there. So the good thing is that's a testimony to the environmental friendliness of what we discharge here. So that's about it. Wow. Thanks, Chad, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That was very interesting. So, yeah. Really okay. Cool. Well, let's walk up the hill there. Mark, can I get a picture with you? Oh, okay, sure. Okay. Just got matching shirts and everything. Oh, yeah. Goofy picture. There we go. You know what she's going to want to hit in there. You can net it out very well. Even in the property. Yeah, to communicate. Isn't that a
Brandon, you guys uh, just track this ring. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, it's a Facebook page tonight, I think. Uh, I took a couple earlier of everybody, so. It's nice to have some nice to have Oh, it's just nice to have some nice to have some nice to have Street that takes us back to the big building. I think it's the street just goes straight there. Coronaries, don't you? wanted to
We went down and uh, Parks and Rec had a try it out night. For lacrosse? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Mark you was know, just saying that our kids used to go to school together at Health City. Okay. And it's actually tougher for uh, boys because the, the prospect for boys in the net is <laughs> so you guys, this is, girls, is almost This is Jeff working team. He's appeared to Mark out here. He runs the whole maintenance team to keep this oh. plant running. Thank you. And the keeper of the key. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the most important part of the uh, yeah, it was, it was one of those things that really surprised me because for girls, the, the net is, or the end of the stick is almost flat for girls, so they have to hold the ball by turning the stick where the boys have more of a basket, but for boys it's more contact. So they, oh, they were telling us. They were so this was the whole body. governing body at the time? Yeah. Boys. Really? Yeah. Oh, I know. I remember he was mayor, but they only had two others besides him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was the commission. Wow. Three member commission. Yeah, they were from five to three. It was kind of a... Okay. Okay. They had three, and then I think in the mid '80s they went to five. In the '80s, around '85, they went to five. Oh. <laughs> Ask Could we leave? You guys see some ID? I just talked to her the other day. Oh yeah. Yeah, she's down in uh, Avon. 
<laughs> okay. So, how so, big was Sioux Falls then? Probably like 75. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he handles the children. I know, that's why I'm telling her. <laughs> Yeah. All right, guys. All right, see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed the tour. Yeah, I did. Yep. Oh, thank you, guys, very much. I know it's time, but it's good to see everything you guys have done. Thank you. 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 Thank